Happy Halloween, my friends. Stick around to the end of the normal, true, spooky stories to hear a special treat from my good friend and horror author, Eric Kuhn. He'll be promoting his upcoming self-published book of five short horror stories this Halloween, and if you fancy his style, you can pre-order his book using the Amazon link below. Enjoy. When I was 21, I lived with my two friends, Bruce and Ollie. We lived in a small house, in a nice family-friendly neighborhood in the suburbs of our major city. Ollie owned the house and occupied the master bedroom on the main floor, and Bruce had the other bedroom on the main floor. My bedroom was on the mostly finished basement, which was great because I had a ton of privacy and a lot of open space. There was a side door that could be accessed from the basement so I could come and go as I pleased without bothering the other roommates. We were all pretty close, but it was nice to feel like I had my own living space, even though there were three of us in the house. At the time, Bruce and I were huge fans of Halloween and the fall season in general. But being adults and having full-time jobs, it wasn't really ideal for us to go out and attend Halloween parties like a lot of the other people we knew. Also, Halloween fell on a Tuesday this year, so instead we decided to just watch some horror movies in my basement bedroom and just hang out and relax. After we watched a couple of movies, we started to get a little bored. It was about 11pm and the trick-or-treaters were home and most people were in for the night. Knowing we had to work in the AM, we decided it would be a good idea for us to go on a quick walk and call it a night. There is something about the air on Halloween night. It's like when you go on a vacation to Florida and the night breeze just feels and smells different. That's how it is on Halloween. It's nostalgic and can almost give you a euphoric feeling. Anyway, as we started to walk in the quiet and somewhat desolate neighborhood, we approached the park. Now we walk through this park all the time during the day, probably at least 50 times at this point. It was a little park right in the middle of the neighborhood. The park had a main entrance from one of the busier streets and a back entrance from the street we lived on. The back entrance was covered with a lot of trees and a very small wooded area. About 30 yards from the entrance, there were three baseball fields, a pavilion, and a basketball court. We walked into the back entrance where all the trees were and it was nearly pitch black, but there was a low orange hue from the streetlight barely making its way through the trees. As we walked through the wooded area, we both stopped abruptly. We thought we saw a man standing at the end of the path. The figure was completely still, and it was so dark we couldn't be sure what it was. I called out. Hey! To the figure, but no response. I suggested we should turn around, but Bruce said we should check it out, which was unlike him because I was usually the braver of us two. As we got closer, it was clear it was a man standing there. The man was completely still and had both of his hands in his front hoodie pocket. His head was down facing the ground. Trying not to freak out, we decided to slowly back up and make our way to the street and our house without further confrontation. Before we even moved, we heard a noise next to us coming from both sides. Trying to focus our eyes in the darkness, we saw two more figures moving towards us in the woods. Unlike the other guy just standing there, these people were approaching us. I wish I could explain the feeling I felt inside me during this point. It's like the sinking pit in your stomach when a cop pulls up behind you with his lights on, but 100 times worse. Fight or flight kicked in and we turned and sprinted full speed out of that park and onto our street, never looking back to see if they were following us. We ran right to our house and locked the doors behind us. While sitting in the basement, we had all the lights off and we were trying to look out the basement windows to see if we could see if anyone followed us or possibly saw the house we went into. We were so scared we didn't know what to do. Were we in real danger? Was it someone just playing a prank? After about half an hour or so, we decided that they most likely didn't follow us and it was probably okay to go to sleep, especially considering we both had work in the morning. At about 2.30 in the morning, Bruce woke me up. He said he thought he heard something outside his bedroom window. I went to his room and looked out the window and I could see a pumpkin laying in our backyard. This was concerning because we didn't have any pumpkins outside our house. We didn't set any up for decorations or anything like that. For the second time tonight, we were terrified and decided to go into the living room. 
While in the living room, we made sure we had the house lights off and began looking out the front windows. Within the first minute of looking, there they were, three men standing in the middle of the road just staring at our house. We thought about calling the police, but what were we going to tell them? There are three guys not standing on our property who may or may not have thrown a pumpkin in our backyard. We just sat in the living room for about ten minutes trying to think of something, anything we could do. We made sure the front door was locked and grabbed a baseball bat and I think a kitchen knife. We looked out the window again and the three men were gone. Nothing but the illumination from the street lights. For the rest of the night we stayed in the living room watching Sports Center until we eventually dozed off. Morning finally came. As we got ready for work, we just agreed it was probably just a Halloween prank and we should move on and forget about it. However, when I got to my car, there was a note on my windshield that said, Happy Halloween, with a smiling face sticker on it. What I read next gave me the same feeling I had just had a few hours before when I thought we were in real danger. At the bottom on the paper it said, P.S. Good thing you lock your doors. What would these people have done if the doors were unlocked? Bruce and I both decided to call in from work and stay home that day. Nothing else of note happened regarding this incident, but it's just a reminder that it doesn't matter how quiet and nice a neighborhood you think you live in. On Halloween, anything can happen. As we slowly enter the fall season, I'd like to share a story with you that happened to me a few years ago. I have mentioned this story to some of my close personal friends and family, many of which don't believe me, and that's fine. They probably think I'm just joking around or trying to scare them, but I know I experienced something that night and I wish I had a better explanation for it. At the time these events took place, I lived on a quiet street a little outside the city but not quite into the suburbs. My street had a big rundown house at the very end of the block that was across from an unused parking lot and an out of business bar. The person who inhabited the house before it became dilapidated was Mrs. Morgan. Mrs. Morgan was an old curmudgeon in every sense of the word. Every time my friends and I would walk by the house, she would yell at us and make some insanely random comment like we were trampling her garden or using her garbage to play hide and seek or some other incoherent nonsense that wasn't true. Even though my friends and I did get into some adolescence trouble around the neighborhood, we never did anything to Mrs. Morgan. Our parents always told us that we should try and be nice. I mean, she was a widow and had no children, so it must have been a pretty lonely life. Rewind about three years ago and Mrs. Morgan unfortunately passes away, and the house becomes abandoned and, I believe, eventually condemned. At least there were signs on the boarded up windows and doors, but... I never got close enough to read what they said. Needless to say, it became an eyesore for the community in what was a pretty quiet and uneventful street. My girlfriend at the time only lived a couple of blocks and I would usually walk to and from her house when we hung out. It was literally a four minute walk top so it was no big deal. I would pass Mrs. Morgan's abandoned house and the empty parking lot with the out of business bar every time I walked to and from her house. Now fast forward to a few years ago the last time I ever made that walk. It was about 3 a.m. on Halloween night, I guess technically November 1st, and I was walking home from my girlfriend's house. I was supposed to be home way earlier in the night, but we both fell asleep watching scary movies and pigging out on the extra candy her parents didn't hand out. As I made it to my street and started my walk past Mrs. Morgan's house, I heard a noise. I stopped for a minute to make sure it wasn't a skunk because for some odd reason that's the first thing that popped in my mind when I heard the noise. I slowed down a little bit and looked at the house as I proceeded cautiously. That's when I noticed the front door that was usually boarded up and had a sign posted on it was now open. I tried to rationalize why the door was now open, saying to myself it was probably the wind but then again it was a beautiful calm night. I then paused in front of the house and looked directly at the front door, and that's when I saw her, Mrs. Morgan, right there, staring back at me. I knew for sure it was her, but how? She had passed away and the house was clearly unlivable for anyone else. At this point, I was so scared that I just shouted something out. 
I don't even remember if it was words or just noises. The figure stepped onto the front porch and continued to stare at me. I broke my stare and just started running back to my house, turning back every now and then to see if she was still staring at me or perhaps following me. I made it back to my house probably 30 seconds later and opened the side door and went down to my room. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. I'm not sure if I was overtired or just had scary things in my subconscious with it being Halloween and watching movies all night, but I know I saw Mrs. Morgan standing there only a couple of feet away from me. Whether it was a true paranormal encounter or something that my mind made me think I saw, I will never know for sure. But hey, they always say that the veil between the living and the dead is at its thinnest on Halloween, and now... I actually believe it. Alright, so you guys might not find this creepy or scary enough, but I thought it was worth sharing. This is something that I experienced when I was a kid, probably between the ages of 10 to 14. Our Halloween tradition was that my parents and I would meet up with my godparents and their son and go trick-or-treating around our neighborhood. This has been a tradition with my older siblings as well, so it's fair to say this tradition has started even before I was born. Anyway, we follow the same route every year, the highlight being stopping at the local funeral home that was only about three blocks from my house. The funeral home had a big party in their parking lot every Halloween. They provided cotton candy, candy apples, donuts, cider, popcorn, balloons, and probably even more, all free. If you wanted a balloon, which every kid did, you had to shake the hand of the person in the full-on movie set quality gorilla suit. I hated doing it because the gorilla shook your hand so hard I borderline thought my hand was going to break. So, every year it was the same thing. If you wanted a balloon, you had to shake his hand. I developed kind of an anxiety as it related to the gorilla, so I would just grab the snacks to avoid the person in the gorilla costume. Also, I was getting older and I really didn't care about balloons, but it seemed as though the gorilla would follow me around and put a balloon out in his right hand like he wanted me to take it. I tried my best just to avoid it and hurry my parents on so we could continue trick-or-treating. They thought it was the funniest thing that I was scared of the gorilla. I really don't think I was, I think I just thought it was weird that a grown man dressed in a costume would shatter kids' hands in order to give them a balloon. So this story revolves around one Halloween, where we followed the same routine as previously mentioned. I ignored the person in the gorilla costume when it came to that part of the night and had a pretty uneventful night trick-or-treating. I remember I was still at the age where I had a bedtime and my parents had to check my candy. Yes, they were those parents. I was still impressionable enough that horror movies scared the crap out of me and I couldn't even watch them because then I couldn't sleep with the lights off. For whatever reason that night, I felt particularly uneasy and scared. I had avoided scary movies so I could get a good night's sleep, but for some reason, I was unsettled. I ended up sleeping on the floor with my chocolate lab and my dad passed out on the couch, which gave me some sense of relief. I got up in the middle of the night to let my dog out. I knew she had to go out because she was pacing back and forth. She was quick and came right back in, but on the way back to the living room, I saw something in the street. It was a figure that seemed to be just standing there. I crept up to the window on my knees to get a better look so I couldn't be seen. I swear to God it was that gorilla holding the balloons, literally standing right outside my house. I didn't know what to do. I was scared, but more scared that this person was going to approach my house. I woke up my dad who was snoring so loud I was surprised the neighbors weren't awake. I told him there was someone outside and he got up immediately and opened the front door, but there was no one in the street. No one around at all, at least that he could see. I told him what I thought I saw, and he said it was probably just a bad dream or my imagination. We turned the TV on in the living room for a while because I think he could tell I was unsettled and was having trouble trying to fall back asleep. I can sit here today writing this and honestly tell you, I don't know what happened. I never had any other episodes where I thought I saw something that wasn't there. I don't sleepwalk. I don't often have nightmares. I don't know how to explain what I saw. It was a long time ago and now I'm an adult who takes his own niece and nephew trick-or-treating. 
but every time around fall I always think about this experience and try to come to a logical conclusion to explain what happened. I still can't figure it out and probably never will. I wonder if that funeral home is still open and if the guy in the gorilla costume is still there. Let me start this story by saying I have only shared this story with a few people up to this point. I trusted a few close friends who I thought would believe me, but that's about it. I can remember the events of this specific night vividly. My parents own a camp on a local lake about 25 minutes from my hometown. It's pretty awesome to go there, bring friends, and basically do what we want. My friends and I would usually throw smaller parties out there all summer long. There was always activity on the lake, but nothing that really ever raised any alarms. We kind of just chalked it up to either boats, wind, or animals if we thought we saw something in the lake after it got dark. One Halloween night, I decided it would be a good idea to skip the Halloween party that was taking place in town and bring my boyfriend back to the camp house for the night so we could be alone. My parents thought I would be at said Halloween party and would be spending the night at a friend's house. We arrived at the camp pretty late, around 9 or 10 p.m. One thing I remember about the camp is how dark it was, void of any street lights and usually only illuminated by the stars in the sky. My boyfriend and I stayed up for a couple of hours talking, eating, and I think we played a board game or something like that. I would guess we fell asleep at some point after midnight. After about an hour or so of sleeping, I woke up suddenly to what seemed to be a loud blast, like a gunshot, but distorted somehow. I just remember it being so loud that I couldn't even remember where I was when I woke up. I looked over the couch and my boyfriend was somehow still asleep. I got up and looked out the back door window which had a view of the lake. I saw something that looked like a light or a ball of light over the lake. I stared at the floating light in confusion trying to figure out what it was. Was it a flashlight or something glowing from under the water? Without really thinking, I slipped on my flip-flops and I went outside and approached the shore, still staring at the light, squinting my eyes trying to make out what it was. It was an orange-colored light, maybe 75 feet out into the lake and what seemed to be floating a couple of feet off the top of the water. After about two minutes of continued staring and squinting, the orange color changed to a bright purple and several white specks of light came out of the purple glow and hovered all around the glowing orb. As I started to freak out as to what this could be, I was forced to my knees by the loud blasting noise I heard earlier. I started to plug my ears, collect myself, and turn back to the house to grab my boyfriend. I saw a huge flash, and the next thing I remember was waking up in an Adirondack chair on my neighbor's yard the next morning. My flip-flops that I wore outside to get a closer look at the lake were gone. I had no idea how to explain the events of the night and, long story short, I went to the doctor and after seeing neurological specialists, they don't show any sign that I could have had an episode. I've been told that it was most likely a vivid nightmare and that I was sleepwalking and that's how I ended up on my neighbor's porch. Also, that would explain why my boyfriend never woke up. However, I believe this night I saw something otherworldly. I don't believe in the paranormal and until this point I didn't believe in the extraterrestrial. But this didn't feel like a nightmare. It felt real. I can still see the images and hear the noises from that night. I know many of you may not believe my story and that's fine. But I feel like I wanted to share the experience I had that night. I'm no longer with that boyfriend and even though he was concerned for my well-being, especially immediately after the events, I don't think he really believed my story either. Needless to say, I spend less time at the camp and am reminded of this night every year around this time when Halloween decorations start popping up in the stores. The events of this story took place when I was 18 and in my senior year of high school. I'm 27 now and still have horrible flashbacks from that Halloween night. My friends and I liked to party in high school, and Halloween was obviously one of the best nights to go out and party. We got to dress up in sexy outfits and have an excuse to act a little crazy. 
my friends usually drew all the attention from the guys we went to school with. I was still friends with all the boys, but none of them really ever showed any interest outside of friendship. Anyway, on this particular Halloween, we had a party at my friend Steve's house. Like a lot of high school parties, no one knew how to handle their alcohol. At about 11, the cops had already been called for a noise complaint. The party scattered and everyone ran as to not get detained or get their information taken by police. My friend Amy, who was getting into a car with her boyfriend, told me to jump into the car with her friend Dave and he would take us to another party, which I begrudgingly decided to do. The car ride was weird. Just him and I, who didn't know each other and didn't really have much to say. Awkward. The car smelled like Slim Jims and body odor and looked rather messy. Dave had a mask, which was on his lap while he was driving. He had a hooded sweatshirt, blue jeans, and brown work boots on to complete the costume. He also had a scraggly beard and greasy hair. I tried asking questions to make the drive less awkward, but he didn't really answer them and didn't seem interested in holding a conversation. Finally, I asked what school he went to and he responded, I dropped out of college a year ago. So I asked, well, how old are you? He responded in a shaky, almost nervous voice, I, I'm 25. This freaked me out a little bit because he was older than me and he just dropped out of college at the age of 25. Also, he was 25 and was just leaving a high school party. Trying not to let him in on the fact that I was kind of nervous, I asked, So, how do you know Amy? And he responded in his shaky and unflattering voice, he said, Who, who, who's Amy? I sunk into my seat, pinching my sides, not knowing what to do. She's the blonde who told me to get in the car with you. He responded with a very stoic, Oh, her. Yeah. She told me you were single. I didn't respond. I honestly didn't know what to say. Did this guy really not know Amy? Or was he just tipsy and confused? I texted Amy as we were driving to tell her how angry I was, but she didn't answer. About 10 or 15 minutes in the car, which seemed like forever... We arrived at a house. It didn't seem to be a very nice part of town or at least an area I was accustomed to going to parties. I looked for Amy's car or any car I recognized, but it was just too dark to point anything out. We approached a red door with chipped paint lit up only by a dull front light. Dave didn't even knock and just walked into the house, so I followed him, hoping to see a familiar face. The house was cold and smelled awful. We walked into the front room, which I assumed would be the living room. It was dirty and had an olive green shag carpet with an old brown couch. The walls were white with chipped paint and stains everywhere. Piles of pizza boxes and beer cans lined the floors. The room was only lit by one lamp that was on the floor and it gave off a very low light. On the brown couch there was a man and woman sitting very close together but not really moving. They looked to be passed out or maybe just drunk. We walked into the kitchen, which was just more of the same. Trash and that horrid smell of garbage. In the kitchen, there was a man probably in his 20s who looked like he may have been using. He gave Dave a high five and introduced himself to me as Skip. He looked at Dave and back at me and smiled. His yellow teeth and bug eyes made my skin crawl. The other man in the kitchen was an older gentleman, maybe in his 40s or 50s. I couldn't tell. He said nothing and just looked at me. I felt sick to my stomach, and the only reason why I didn't run out of this place was because I had no clue where I was, and had no clue if these people were capable of anything dangerous. Again, I texted Amy with no answer, deciding to not call as my phone only had 5% battery. Dave escorted me into the back room, which was kind of like a screened-in porch. I felt a brief moment of relief seeing about six or seven people out there. There were only two girls out of the bunch and they were half naked and looked like they weighed a maximum of 90 pounds. I could feel everybody staring at me but at least there was a group of people and I wasn't secluded or alone with this Dave. I know it sounds crazy but I felt almost safe being around this larger crowd but this temporary relief faded very quickly when the two girls left with all the guys who had been on the porch. They re-entered the house and disappeared out of sight. As I sat in this screened-in room trying to think of my options, Dave finally spoke up 
and said, I think you're really cute. I said thanks and kind of shrugged it off. He got up and started to rub my back and began breathing very heavily. After about five minutes of the most unpleasant back rub I had ever had, he stepped in front of me and asked if I wanted to go somewhere more private. I said to him in a terrified, cracking voice, I- I'm sorry, but I'm not that kind of girl. I could see the displeasure and anger in his face, and I could feel the tears coming. Then nothing short of a miracle happened. One of the girls who went inside just a minute before began to scream erratically, swearing and yelling at everyone in the room. Dave ran upstairs, leaving me downstairs in the back room alone, and without even thinking twice, I got up and climbed out the window and ran. I didn't care that I didn't know where I was. I wasn't going to stop until I was to a gas station or a 7-Eleven or something. I was running down the street, staying close to the sidewalk, trying not to bring any attention to myself. After what seemed like a few minutes, I luckily approached a 24-hour Walmart. I walked in and had the night manager call my parents as my cell phone was now dead. It was about 30 minutes from my house and my parents were on their way. Just as I thought I could relax and try to put these horrifying events behind me, Dave and his friend Skip walked into the Walmart. They didn't see me, but I couldn't believe that they were in the same store. They were looking around like they were looking for something or someone. Was it me or was I being paranoid? The next day, Amy called me and apologized all day, crying and asking what she could do to make it up to me. I got some solace that she confirmed the person I got into the car with was actually Dave and not some random guy, but was still left traumatized thinking about what could have happened. It's been almost 10 years since that night, and I know it could have been a lot worse, and I'm lucky that I was able to leave with no physical harm, but still wouldn't wish the experience I had that night on my worst enemy. I haven't seen Dave, Skip, or any of the people I saw that night, and hope I never do again. Halloween has always been one of my favorite nights of the entire year. From the pagan origins to the more modern take of trick-or-treating, corny movies and dressing up, I just can't get enough. One Halloween, similar to many others, my friends and I decided that we were going to go trick-or-treating. Now, admittedly, we were probably a little old, but it was our tradition and we always had so much fun. We went from house to house getting candy and getting some looks from parents who probably also felt we were a little old. It was a largest group of people, including my current crush at the time, which made the night even more fun. The houses in this area were the ones that gave up full-size candy bars and most people had their homes all decked out in state-of-the-art Halloween decor. As we approached one of the last houses before we were going to call it quits, I noted a particularly scary figure on the front lawn. It looked like a person waiting to jump out and scare us as we walked by. It was a tall figure with a white mask and black covering the eyes. It was hard to tell if it was a mannequin or a person because it was so still. As I walked by, the tall figure grabbed my arm, causing me to almost crap my pants. The man got down to my face and said in a slow, soft voice through his mask, Tag, you're it and then ran into the backyard of the house. We all screamed, laughed, and ran to the front door for candy. Of course, we just assumed this was part of the homeowners trying to scare people who were trick-or-treating. We got our candy, and as I walked away, I turned back to the lady in the doorway and said, That tall guy was really scary, but you might want to tell him not to grab people so hard as they walk by. The woman looked at me like I had grown a second head. I asked if she was alright, and she responded in an almost nervous voice, You're the second young lady tonight to tell me the same story tonight. My husband's inside and we don't have anyone set up outside to scare you kids. Now I'm officially creeped out. I ran to catch up to my friend, still thinking it was still all possibly part of a scare and the lady was just messing with me. The group of us stayed out for a little while longer. Some of us broke off from the larger group and began to walk back to my house. We decided that first we were going to walk by the house where the incident had occurred earlier in the night to see if the tall guy was set up for another scare. When we walked by it, the entire house was black, like they had ran out of candy or left for the night. 
From the sidewalk, I looked into the backyard, and there, the same guy with the white mask. He waved at me, and my friends told me to just ignore it, and it was obviously someone who lived there and was trying to scare us. Once we were almost to my house, I looked back and saw the guy was following us. I yelled, Hey, what's your problem? The entire group then turned around and tried to duck out of the way so we wouldn't see him. At this point, I think my friends could tell I was getting generally freaked out. Once we got inside, I felt more safe and my mind was able to drift away from thinking about that guy. We all hung out for a little while, trading candy, gossiping, and watching TV. Occasionally, someone would make a comment about me being scared of the tall man, and we all laughed and just had some fun with the situation. Once my friends left for the night, I got ready for bed. I was sitting in my bedroom, taking my makeup off, and I just glanced out my window. And there in my backyard was a person. I couldn't believe my eyes. I thought I was seeing things. I went downstairs into the living room to see if I could get a better view of the figure in the yard. The tall man in the mask was now at my back door and was trying to break into the house. He was shaking the door handle and trying to open the door. I screamed for my dad, and then he saw I was standing there. He just looked up and waved at me again, just like before. My dad came barreling down the stairs and the guy didn't even move. My dad called 911 and luckily they were nearby because they showed up in two minutes. They arrested the guy and took him in from the backyard to the cop car. I'll never forget how he looked. They removed the expressionless mask and somehow his real face had even less of an expression. He was clean cut with short dirty blonde hair. His eyes didn't even blink and his mouth remained shut. There was no expression, almost a lifeless look. But as they put him into the cop car, he took one last look back and a creepy smile came across the lifeless face. A smile of a person who clearly didn't have a full comprehension of what was going on. I still think back to that Halloween night. And even with how bad that experience was, I am thankful it wasn't worse. Halloween night is always accompanied with a feeling of fear, even if it's a small amount, perhaps it's just psychological, but there always seems to be an eeriness to the night at least in my experience. During the events of this story, I lived in a small, quiet town in the upper northeast region of the United States. My hometown is filled with lots of forests and, being somewhat of an outcast, I would usually just hike on the trails around my house. I would get out of school and just walk for hours before I came home. The older I became, the more deep into the woods I would go. When I was 16 years old, I found this little cave tucked deep within the woods. It was probably about 200 yards or so from the main road. The cave sat at the base of a small cliff about 30 feet high. It had a pretty big opening and the deeper you went into the cave, the more narrow it became. The cave seemed almost man-made, like it was carved into the side of the cliff. About 20 feet or so into the cave was the back wall with all of these strange rock formations of all different sizes. Also off to the right there was a small little tunnel that I tried to explore one time but gave up due to the fact that it was barely big enough to fit through and not to mention it was accompanied by pitch blackness. So for the next two years I would often visit this little cave. When I would have difficult days in school or just needed to get away from home I would go. I would read there, meditate, or just listen to music. I would always think of crazy origin stories for the cave like it was some kind of special place with an interesting backstory. In reality, it was probably nothing of the sort, but it was fun to imagine the possibilities. My senior year of high school, I decided I was too old to go trick-or-treating and I didn't have a friend who even asked me to do anything, so I thought it would be a really great idea to get some candles and go to my little cave and read some scary stories. I figured since Halloween was on Friday, I could stay out all night and read. My parents trusted me and really never worried about me because I was responsible and had never gotten in any kind of trouble before. At about 9pm, I gathered all my belongings for the night and started my hike to the spot. I wanted to wait until about 9 o'clock-ish so all the kids were off the streets and it would be really quiet. From my house, it would probably take me about 45 minutes or so to get to the cave. I know for some people that may sound crazy to walk that far, but 
For me, it was therapeutic to be outside in the crisp fall air, especially on Halloween night. Shortly after 10, I started to close in on my destination. As I approached the large opening of the cave, I thought I could make out a low orange flicker coming from the walls of the cave. I turned my lights off and slowly approached. I immediately felt disappointment as I crept slowly to the opening. Someone else is using the cave, I thought. But what I saw was not somebody reading or just hanging out. There were four women in the cave, probably late twenties or thirties, all holding hands. They were standing in a circle and seemed to be speaking in unison, but I couldn't make out what they were saying. There must have been hundreds of candles lit because it was illuminating the entire cave, even several feet outside the cave. I couldn't make out what the women really looked like, but they sort of looked ragged or dirty, their clothes being loose and baggy. I sat and just stared at these women for several minutes trying to figure out what they were doing, which turned out to be a huge mistake. As I sat from the bushes and observed, the women suddenly stopped chanting and abruptly turned and stared at the small hole in the wall. I swear at this point I heard a growl coming from the cave, not like a growl from a dog, but something different, something distinctive. I saw a movement from the small tunnel inside the cave, and before I knew it, the four women all snapped their heads back and looked right at me, looking at me through the bush. But how could they see me? It was pitch dark out, for God's sakes. All four women in perfect sync slowly brought their fingers up and pointed at me, and in a flash, they all began to run at me. I turned and ran as fast as I could. As I made my way towards the main road, all I could hear was screaming and laughing, or was it crying? I don't know, it was hard to tell. As I was closing in on the main road, I turned one time to see if the women were still behind me, and not only were they behind me, one of them was inches from me. Her teeth were yellow, her eyes were big and black, and she had the most haunting smile I've ever seen. I turned and ran as fast as I could, never looking back again. I got home that night and just cried because I had no idea what else to do. I'm now 26 years old and still have not gone into another forest by myself. I'm not sure what I saw that Halloween. People playing a prank. I honestly can't tell you, but I know that I never went back to find out. Road Rage by Eric Kuhn Barreling down the exit at 80 miles an hour, for Josh, driving was a competitive sport for which he had no safety concern for himself, his Corolla, or anything else. Getting off the exit, he slams on his brake and stares down the trail of five mile an hour traffic that stretches out before him. He swears under his breath and instead of immediately merging, he races to the end of the merge lane. Here, he ends up next to a green Honda Civic and tries to cut in front of him, but for some reason the Civic isn't letting him over. Josh moves forward, but the Civic matches his advances. What a jerk, can he see him trying to get over? Josh hasn't lost a game of chicken yet, and he wasn't about to let this be the first. This guy better have good insurance, Josh thinks, as the two cars inch closer and closer to each other. He would wear a scratch or two on his car as a badge of honor, but he didn't want to speak for the other guy. Right before the front left headlight of his Corolla kissed the front right headlight of the Civic, the green car stops and Josh pulls in front of him. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Josh joins the sea of cars, intending to forget about the green Civic and continue on his journey. Honk, honk, honk. Josh slams on his brakes and glares at the green car behind him through his rearview mirror. Oh man, this guy. Josh wasn't a stranger to messing with people in traffic, and he could mess with this guy for as long as he needed. The Civic's front left turn signal flashes yellow, but Josh decides to be one step ahead of him and merge to the left lane staying in front of the Civic and preventing him from moving ahead of him. Josh slams on his brakes and the Civic does the same. If only his reaction time was a little bit slower, I could claim he rear-ended me. Josh could feel the rage coming from the green Civic and laughed. He felt like Emperor Palpatine. This time not using his turn signal, he saw the Civic lurch to the right back into its original lane. No, no. 
Josh slides into his right lane and slams on his brake once again, still ahead of the Civic. This time, the Civic stalls and lets Josh drive away. Smell you later. An hour later, Josh is sitting in Rockwood Diner, picking from a plate of chicken wings and fries. Thinking back to the incident with the green Civic, he was proud of how he acted. He was perfectly calm during the entire thing. His heartbeat never even got up to a minor panic rate. He sloppily sticks a whole bone in his mouth, sucks the sauce off of it, and spits it back into the plate. The bone makes a loud sound when it hits the porcelain. Other patrons are staring, but Josh doesn't care about them. He's enjoying himself, wiping barbecue sauce onto his shirt and belching like Jabba the Hutt. While sucking on one of the bones, a loud horn outside makes him jump, and in one quick second, the bone slides down his wet tongue and into his throat, where his next breath freezes in place. For the next few seconds, Josh sits in silent stillness, trying to breathe in harder and harder, only trapping the bone in his throat more and more. Suddenly, his trachea clenches shut and Josh starts to bang madly on the counter. The patrons who were staring before angrily now stare in horror. Josh, feeling his chest and neck tighten and constrict, falls off his stool and onto the floor. His vision becomes blurry as his brain loses oxygen. People around him start screaming and someone grabs the phone to dial 911, not knowing the gesture would be futile. Someone runs up to him and looks at him in horror. Josh's lips were turning a dark blue and his eyes are bulging out. Before he dies, Josh looks out the window. He sees a chorus of black dots circle around the setting sun and a tear rolls down out of his eye. Mainly because he can't hold them that high anymore, his eyes look down at the parking lot. Right in his field of vision, he sees a skinny, tall figure standing in front of a green Civic. It was smiling. Hey friends, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed Eric Kuhn's story at the end, there's more to come when you pre-order his book releasing October 31st this year. Links in the description. And be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story of your own, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear it featured here on the channel. And join my Discord to interact with me and all the other cool people in the community directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt.com. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and happy Halloween.